I'm Hannah Palma Mera. I'm part of the Harvard Catalyst team, and we've been working with the IPVQ team, um, along with Griffin and Diane, to create to build out this new UI. Um, and of course, our four team members: we have um, Nick Bennett, Mark Denis, Preminger, and Mark Sariello and myself. So we've been working on this over the past year and a half. Um, so I'll be demoing from our local instance, just because I have all the data set up here. And right now I'm going to be logging in as just a regular researcher. Um, this is choose a project, and you can see announcements. That's some of the features we've imported into this new UI. Um, so the ITPT software we all know connects to the EHR data repositories, um, and specifically the I2B2 query and analysis tool um, helps researchers to formulate those research questions and obtain a patient count. Um, of course, it does a lot more than that, and one of the things that's really exciting about this new UI is that it really helps researchers uncover a lot of these really cool and robust features. Um, as Griffin mentioned, a lot of the work that went into this new UI was based off of work that we implemented for the Shrine Bug Find a few years ago. Um, so about four years ago, um, the Harvard Catalyst team released a new web client for Shrine, which was based, um, which was based off of the old I2B2 web client and is a federated network tool. So we leveraged a lot of those learnings and incorporated it into this new UI. Um, and we had some goals with the new UI, which was to replace the relics from the I2B2 tech stack, mainly Yahoo interface. We wanted to unify um, the I2B2 and the Shrine UI. And then we wanted to make sure we were continuing to support the legacy plugins, because a lot of them were created in the old tech stack. Um, and then for this particular release, under at a high level, it includes some technical improvements. Um, we did some refactoring work for the query runner. We created a new framework to support custom by value work. Um, so these are like lab values and modifiers. Um, there's no change in the UI, but we did publish a readme documentation in GitHub, so it's really easy for sites to create their own custom lab value pickers. Um, Jeff gave you a quick preview of the admin tool yesterday, so that's something that will easily allow um, admins to add users, to easily define projects, and to associate those users to a project and define their roles. And then we also, um, in this uh, specific release, we have the data exporter, which I'll show how it looks like here. Um, along with that, we also made some improvements. Um, so you'll notice here um, we have new icons. Thomas uh, did a really good job working on that. Um, we actually have a way to
to search. Um, so for example, I'm going to do diabetes. Um, I'm just going to click this search. And you'll see all the search results are nicely laid out below. Um, if I wanted to filter by a specific coding system or a category, I would just go here and apply the relevant filters. These correspond to the root folders you saw just before. Or if I knew a specific code that I wanted to search for, such as E11.9, I can just specify the coding system it's a part of, and it will locate that term. Um, yeah, Mama, what do you want to search? That any term is the default. So if I did. You mean just. We have an all here, don't we? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, I didn't realize that. So you'd have to exit out, and it re restores the filters. So the X is what does that. So I'll just show that again. And then the, uh, yeah. So that, that's how it clears it out. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. What else do I have here? Oh, let me go back to the search results. So again, you'll see that the tree view, it, it's, it's replaced by this new search view. Um, if I want to go back and see this in the context of its uh, hierarchy relationship, I can just go browse in tree, and it'll automatically expand that tree view, and you can see that term in its relative position. Um, since the search is still on, um, and I want to go back and view that search results, I could click this view search mode, and it will restore or retain my search results. So that's a way that the user can search and then continue to see their um, search results. So I'll clear this out. All right, so I have a few queries that I've already run, but I just wanna um, reload them so you could see how it looks like. So if I go here first, um, so you'll notice here on the right-hand side, um, it's just one panel. It's telling you to drag a concept here. So as soon as I drag it over, it's gonna to continue to add um, panels underneath it. So what it's doing is that constructing the panels from the top to bottom, and you're meant to read it like a sentence. So you're trying to find patients with circulatory, uh, diagnosis of circulatory system, and so the um, within a panel, there are or statements, between panels, it's an and statement. So that reading it from top to bottom really helps to sort of um, write, like figure out what you're trying to um, the patient cohorts are trying to find without actually writing any type of SQL code. So if I just drag, continue to dragging over concepts here, you'll see it has the or, um, and then down below here. And as soon as I keep adding, it'll keep continue to add additional panels. Um, I can specify exclusion by just clicking the without, so it changes colors here. Um, and I'll come back and I'll do the when, which is a temporal query. So I'll have that later. Um, so I ran some of these queries before, so I'll show you what they, when I reload them, what happens. So here I'm looking for males um, and circulatory system. I have 40 patients. When I ran uh, the query, I specifically asked for age distribution. So you'll see the graphs below here um, and a, a readout. I can also have a PDF of it. And so this is just what the PDF would look like if you wanted to export the data. Um, here's another example the where I ran a, la um, a lab. So I'm trying to look for the specific laboratory test. Um, so let me go back and reload this. And this is the lab test I want. Um, so it comes up with this um, value box picker. I want to specify something. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I have this reference here. So I can click greater than 400. Um, it displays that value here. If I decide to edit, you can click this little icon here, and that will allow you to edit the values. Um, so when I run the query, um, now number of patients, that's always the default um, 
query result, but there's um, all types of results that you can get. You can get patient sets, encounter sets, timelines, um, the out of the box breakdowns, which is gender, vital status, age, and race, and then some of these other more customized um, breakdowns. So let's do this. The five patients. Um, and then there's you know, you can continue to build on the complexity of this query. So this one that I ran, I specified a specific date range that this concept had to occur in their medical record. Um, so this, I only have one concept here, but if I show you what happens, if I keep adding concepts, I can add um, date ranges by clicking this little icon for that specific concept, or I can apply a date range to the um, entire panel. So it's another way to further to further constrain the query that you're trying to run. Um, another example here was uh, uh, this particular query. I wanted the number of times that the circulatory system um, concept appeared in their medical records at least three times. So you'll see the number is changing uh, each time because it's searching for those constraints that you added. Um, and the last thing I want to point out here, as you're constructing these queries, um, these are all treated as independent events. So these concepts occur at any point in their medical record. There's no sequence of events or no order of the events. It's just, you know, it says mail, and at some point um, in their medical record, di circulatory system appears. Um, and then I did want to show this one more thing, which was a nested query. So nested queries are a really unique way to build out more complex queries. Um, so he, I can just rebuild this out to make sure I have my cardiovascular regions. Okay, so if I go back, um, you know, so this was my first query, which was mail and circulatory system. But if I want to use this as its own concept, I can drag it in here and that becomes its own um, concept and then I can continue to build out the query. So this enables me to do those complex and or logical operators. All right, and the other thing I want to show here was also the timeline. So specifically when I ran this query and I can rerun it, I selected um, patient breakdown and then a timeline and then this triggers um, this timeline plugin to work. And so what's really cool about it, it allows you to look at the patient medical record and it displays all the information here. You can look at it, because I have the right permissions, because this user has um, all of the roles in the um, permission, in the data model, um, I can see all the specific observation details. So it's a way to like really drill down and see really uh, detailed information about that particular patient. Um, all right, so one other things I want to talk about is previous queries. So here are a list of all the queries that the user has run. Um, I can search for queries here. I can, again, specify by how I want to search, whether I'm looking for a specific patient, a result type, or a query name. I can also specify by the date, if there's a date that I know I ran this query and I want to look for it. So it's just an easy way to manage um, the user's previous history. Um, all right, so now I'll just go and talk about the event-based queries, and I think I should have ran one here. All right, so I'll just reload this. So event-based queries, like I said, are a little different than your inclusion and exclusion criteria. You'll notice here that it's kind of yellow. It's it is yellow in color to make sure to signify to the user it is a little different than your. Um, other queer, your inclusion and exclusion here. Um, you'll notice here, like I mentioned, this is an um, independent panel, but up here we've replaced it with a time icon to further reinforce the idea that this is an event-based query. And similarly to how we're constructing it from the top to bottom, the event-based query starts with event one and then works your way down to event two. So for this specific query, I'm trying to find patients who had a history of circulatory system that occurred before um, a history of endocrine disorders. So this is sort of the base um, relationship between the two events, but I can expand this box and specify, um, uh, you know, just like the time gap between those two events. And you can continue to build this out and make it complex. I can add 
n number of events to this query. I can modify all of these relationships. Um, I can specify the time gap between it too. So it is a, a way to make it really um, specific and constrain it to the population that you are looking for. And because I already ran this, you can see here, when I use a temporal query, I have 14 patients. And then I just did a check. So when you run it as a uh, regular query, I get 25 patients. So that timeline event is looking, again, for that specific order of events to happen. All right, and then this one is related to modifiers. So you'll notice here the color has slightly changed. So this is because I reloaded it, but um, the same encounters helps when you're trying to construct something um, related to modifiers. And I think this is one most common example that's used. So for this example, I want um, this specific medication, but I'm specifying a dose. I'm also specifying the frequency and I'm specifying the route. So instead of uh, this being treated as three different events, I'm linking it into the same um, encounter. So when I unlink it, it treats it as an independent panel. When I link it, it's gonna make sure that all of these three facts are all found in the same encounter in that patient medical record. See what else? All right, uh, and then the last, um, I guess well, moving on to like newer functionality, um, we now have these data requests down below. So as a researcher, when I'm running a query, I can request all of these data requests. So what it's doing here um, is that it is uh, sending the request, it's sending me the details of it. So I know that a email was sent and this is the email that it's being sent to. In the previous query section, I can expand this and it tells me, um, similarly, uh, you made this request and it's being sent out. When a um, manager logs in or they'll receive an email notification, they'll log into the application, then they'll essentially rerun that same query. They'll identify it because it's appended with a query ID in the front and they'll be able to uh, run it in their backend and obtain that specific data for the user. And then I will also show the um, admin tool. So right now I'm logged in as a researcher. So when I'm trying to access the analysis tool, uh, sorry, the admin um, application, it's not here in this list. So I'll have to log in as an admin first. Oh, that's not good. Oh, I know why. So. Rule, okay, so then if I go to the analysis tool and you'll see the admin plugin pops up here. So I can load that here, I'll click this, um, and I'll start to load the admin um, dashboard. And so when we created this, there were three main actions, like I mentioned, that we wanted to focus on. We wanted to make it easy to add users, we wanted to be easy to define projects, um, and we did that by, when, it, when I go through, I'll show you, but we did it by making sure the, um, you define the project in a sequence of events, um, and then it's really also make it really easy for uh, manager or admins to associate specific users to those projects. And each of those steps, um, there's also the added options to add parameters, which adds more complexity, and we wanted to make it easy for them to associate those parameters to the specific component that they're working on. So right now, if I try to add a user, I'll add Diane as my example. So that's all the information I need. I can click save. It created my new user. Um, I can go back and search in this view to find that user. Um, but I'll go to projects first and I'll use a project I've already created. So if I click this button, I can create it from scratch, but I'm gonna go ahead and click the edit button. So you'll notice it's divided into these four steps. So I have the project details here. I'll continue and then be able to add parameters. Um, so when you add it, it's really easy. Just it's an inline add of the parameter. Um, and I'll save and continue. And then this is the data source that's specific to that project. So you can define your CRC details, the ONT details, and the workspace details. We make it really easy. Um, load the information all in this one screen. 
And then this is the final page, which is the user association page. So at, when you create a project by default, this user, this ag, ag service account user is automatically added to that project. So it eliminates the step that you have to manually add it yourself. And then this is just a quick search where I can find the user I wanna associate to the project. So now this user should be added to this list. Um, by default, um, we set the data path to obfuscated, but when I click this link, I can change their admin path. I can change the level of access they have for that specific project. Um, and then I can also add parameters for that user for that project. And then the last thing, if I wanna exit this, is the Hive setting. So again, this is just a way to um, view the information um, uh, you know, for domain name, environment, if help URL, but also an uh, easy way to add uh, global parameters for the entire application. So again, it's a simple add, it adds a row here, and then you can specify whatever you want that global parameter to be. So I think that's everything I wanted to demo. Does anybody have any questions? I know Mark has the mic. <laughs> um, for the plugin, is there a way to close it to, to reclaim resources? Like if you're done with the admin, let's say for the admin dashboard, and if you no longer want to use it anymore, can you close it? So if you select another plugin, it will um, change it to that plugin. So the idea is that it'll just, this space, this tab is reserved for a, a specific plugin. So you don't have to actually close it, you just, just switch the tabs. Okay. Um, okay. So another one, can we run multiple plugin? Like if, like if you have work with one plugin, right, and you want to use the data from another plugin, Let's say, can you run multiple? I don't think at this point we we are able to do that. Okay. Nick, do you know if that's possible? Being able to run multiple plugins? There's the Any other questions? Oh, come on over here. Um, I, I wondered in the tree view, I think previously there was the option to display patient counts so the um, researchers know how much to expect. Um, is it possible too? Yeah, we do have total nums available. It may be just not set up. Let me try. So, yeah, so we do have it here. Um, so for this user, because they have the right access, we do have the patient counts. Um, we've only set it up so it's only for these three top level folders. Yeah, well, let me open up this one. All right, we're gonna bring Griffin up for a more general work group update. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rainer Palma.